Okay, Harold, uh, can you tell me where you were born and how your family got here? I was born in Prescott, Arizona. My mother's maiden name was Rechdahl. When she married, it changed to Chemis, which we've been out here since 1900, living here now. And uh, they eventually married, and Mom moved out here, helped run the service station with my dad, and uh, just lived here. And from here, we went to grade school, and then got older, we had to take the school bus to Prescott, because that's where the high school was. And so where did your family come from originally? Uh, Mike and Anna Chemis uh, come from Vienna, Austria. Pretty sure that's the right name. And about like anybody else, wanting to make a better life. So that's how they got here. And Grandpa Mike found out selling liquor to the miners and cowboys was a better life than working in the mines. So he... He opened up uh, one, two, three, three different bars here in Humboldt. And what were the names of the bars? Uh, Chemis, Chemis Bar. Okay. And what are the name of your parents? Uh, Verge Chemis is my mother, and Pete Chemis is my father. And do you have any brothers or sisters? Uh, I have a brother, George A. Chemis, and Sonia is Sonia Precha. And do you uh, have any early memories of Dewey Humble as a child, like some of the things that you did here for fun? Oh, the big thing in the books here, showing the smokestacks, was closed down for years. All the tires behind the garage there, we rolled them clear over there to the smokestack, put them inside there, you know, used tires blowing out in tubes, and... Uh, had the smokestacks going a couple years, uh, oh, about 20 years ago, where it looked like the smelter was working again. Then doing that, horses, burros, cattle ran freely. The main highway wasn't in here. It was just a dirt road. People went slower. And chased the horses and burros for I could ride them. Baseball had our bicycles, George, Sonia, and me. And uh, what, go to Prescott to a movie, the drive center to highway, which is closed now, I think, and Elks Theater Studio, yeah, and dances around here and everything. Uh -huh. And did you ever play like in the Agua Fria or? Oh, God, or yes. Oh, God, yes. Played a lot of times in Naga Fria. And matter of fact, Dad would tell us there's about 100 homes across there now. Dad would say, load your over and under 22 shotgun at the Agra Fria River. Now, you don't dare take a gun down there because there's about 100 homes there. So everything changes. So then you saw Dewey Humble when it was, like you basically saw the evolution of Dewey Humble as a smaller town and now how you're saying. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, you knew everybody. Now people are moving in here. And uh, I guess the rent's okay and property value isn't really skyrocketing. So a lot of people are moving out to this area. Then they got Phoenix, 80, 90 miles away, good highways. Then we got Prescott Valley, which wasn't there when I grew up, but now it's there now. So then we had to go to Prescott. Now we do everything at Prescott Valley, banking, mechanic shops and all that now. And what did, it, so you mentioned that your family had a lot of bars in the area and also rentals. Three different bars here in Humboldt. And do you have any early memories as a child, like going to visit your family members there or anything that you did there? My father was born over here at the end of uh, Calumet Street. There was a hospital. Now it's a trailer park. So over the 50, 60, 80 years, Things have just been covered up and rebuilt over. So that's kind of the smelter. It was wide open. You can't go in there now because you're scared of the stacks falling down on you. But other than that, it was uh, 
just a nice place to grow up. Mm-hmm. And I remember you told me that sometimes you would visit, I think, one of your uncles there at the bar, and you would have a soda. Oh, Rudy? The, yeah. Rudy ran the bar, right? About a rock's throw from here. Yeah, Coca-Cola and a candy bar. And I knew all the drunks because uh-huh. we lived here. Yeah. And then um, uh, you also have a tie to the Iron King mine. Oh, my! I think my Uncle Rudy worked there for a little bit before he took the bar over. My grandfather could have bought that bar with Fred Gibbs. Just stories. Uh, Fred Gibb had had a lot of mining claims, but he took him and Mike, my grandfather, which was running the bar there, the second bar down here. And when Fred Gibbs and my grandfather looked down into the pit, the cattle rustlers were cutting the feet off, the hides, and the entrails, and the heads to cover up them from rustling the cattle up in that era. And that's why my grandfather, for $150, didn't go in with Fred Gibbs because of the stench. But the Iron King Mine, I'm reading in the book here, produced over $200 million in its day. So we lost out there. Um, And so then your grandfather then potentially could have uh, bought property, but you also mentioned to me that you had your Uncle Augie that also worked at the Iron King. Oh, Uncle, uh, Dad drove a 10-wheeler dump truck. Augie ran the hoist there, which I I didn't know till I went up there with somebody and seen him work driving the hoist, and that had a cable and a diesel motor there. That's how they did it back then, and that would take the cage with the miners down and bring them out plus they needed any tools of any kind it would take them down and everything was on a bell uh, series and it had an arrow on there and Uncle Og would just look at that which I stood there as a kid and he would bring the ore up and dump it the men up and down and uh they had night shifts too, so I don't know who ran that part of it during the night, but Uncle Log worked the day shift running, pulling the people in and out and materials going in the mine for quite a few years. I heard that once the one of the cables broke in it, and then I guess it had an emergency stop, but it didn't, it didn't work, so it, the cage fell all the way down. There was nobody in it. But it was, I guess, towards the uh, 1960s I heard that that had happened. I, I worked there in the 60s. I don't recall any... I don't recall any of that. Oh. It it must have been before, before okay. I went to work there. And so then you also worked at the Iron King Mine? I worked in the mail department, and yes. how was that? Oh, one of my first jobs. It was good, close to home. Just uh, had to fill the buckets up with different reagents there to get the material to let go of the gold, copper, zinc, lead, whatever it is. And I just had to keep them buckets full and uh, put 150 softball type to crush the ore up as it went into the, what would it be called? It was almost each... Each thing that took the materials in were about as big as this house. Well, they'd crush up the rocks, crushers in a way, and there's four of them, and I helped take care of that, keep the floor clean. But I was making three dollars an hour. That was I was rich, uh-huh. and God, that was in the sixties. Okay, and so when did you begin working there? Who? Okay, graduate. I would say in the sixties. In the sixties. But my uncle Log and them are way before that. But I had no interest in the mine. It was just there. Mm-hmm. But then we made a living from it too. And when did your uncle Og and then your father work in the mine? Oh my God, forties and fifties, forties and fifties. I think they were there. Yeah, and my uncle Og and. Uh, 
Mike and uh, what's his name? Fred Gibbs uh -huh. were looking at that, and I think it opened up in '35. But they looked at in that glory hole before then, and Mike Mike and him made a decision that wasn't a good deal, but it did turn out to be a million dollar industry there. When did you first hear of the mine? Did you just grow up knowing that your dad worked for the mine? And well, we had a garage down here. We did all the flat tires for the ten wheelers. Then Uncle Og worked there. My dad worked there before we had the station down here. And uh, that's how you learn about it. Then they even built us a swimming pool up there. When we go up there, I'll show you where the pool was. So that got us involved in the swimming pool up there in the mine itself. But you could hear the ore cars being dumped, the material from underground being dumped to go into the crusher, then delivered down here to the railroad tracks. So you heard that day and night. So that gets you involved in the mine. And it worked what, 100 people at one time probably, which I worked there, my parent, dad, and uncle, uncles worked there too. Probably my grandfather, but I didn't hear about it. And can you tell me a little bit more about this pool? Like where was it located and was it a community pool? Yes, it was for everybody. And it was just for you to get to the Iron King Mine on the left-hand side. I went up there about a year ago and they're just putting old car bodies there and pieces of metal, kind of a junkyard now. But we got pictures of people being there and just had a diving board. But it was about as long as this house here, 60, 70, 80 feet, blah, blah, 80, 90 foot, 50 foot wide, just a diving board and nobody drowned there or anything else happened. And were a lot of kids there swimming in oh, the summer? Oh, all, all the time. We'd ride our bikes from here to go up there. It's only about a mile, mile and a half. So that was another activity we had here. Mm -hmm. And do you remember if there was any baseball teams in the area? Oh, God, yes. Iron King Mine had a baseball team. My Uncle Rudy, my Uncle Og. I played baseball out here, too, you know, from the schools. But uh, that was about it, just baseball, right? And track, we had a track team. We went to Camp Verde and did that, but we just weren't as good as most of those other little towns. Mm -hmm. And how did you become interested in working at the Iron King Mine when you worked at the mill? Good money. I mean, $3 an hour, we're carrying groceries out for Safeway was a dollar ten. so you always go where the money is. And uh, that's my dad probably and a few of my uncles got me on there, I guess. And uh, Chuck, Chuck Jones, Jones lived right across from our garage down here. He worked there. So I'm pretty sure he's the one that got me on there. But that was the start of my wor working career. And did they train you to do your job with all the chemicals? Uh, I'd go up there for an hour or so and walk with the guys that put all the different reagents to go into the ball mills to uh, get the different processes going. And uh, it wasn't hard to figure out. And what is your favorite memories of your job? Do you have any stories when you're working there? Uh, when you got paid on Friday. <laughs> the, uh, just working with men that I knew for years as having their kids that we played with and working with them and being close to home and having to drive about a mile up and a mile back. But we were all concentrated right here, so it made you feel better because mm -hmm. you knew everybody. And do you have any friends? Did you make any friends in the mind that then you maybe... Uh, hung out with after work or do you have any specific minors? Well, I wasn't old enough to drink, but most of them would. I think that's when the, when the bus driver, my dad drove the school bus, but the my, I guess the guys worked their shift too, then he drove the school bus. 
they had women secretaries, but not too many. It was mostly all men. And uh, train of thought here. They would stop at our bar, <laughs> and I wasn't paid then, so I'm pretty sure the bus driver could sip on his beer too. But they'd load up cases of beer, probably spend a hundred dollars a day back in the forties, fifties. So that was good money for our bar. But uh they made it to Prescott okay. <laughs> but they wouldn't stop coming out going to work after work. So that's how that worked out. And then one of the things that I heard that I don't know that miners did is or that there was like boxing or bare knuckle fighting that happened. Uh that was kind of before my time. Okay. But right here by our old uh garage there, George Russell the Bear. And uh they had it on a chain and a muzzle. Yeah, toenails were clipped, had a muzzle. But he still wrestled the bear, Tad Gilcrease, one of the big bullies, fighter at the bars. He fought the bear. Uh, who else? George fought the bear, wrestled the bear. But the bear usually, the bear could turn and spin where a miner or an older person couldn't turn as quick as him. And the bear always had the guy down dragging him, pushing him around the dirt. But the guy had a he had a muzzle, no claws, and had a good halter on him. So that was in it. That was right here. That was pretty interesting. And so you never worked underground then? No, I I wanted to go underground when I knew my uncle Og ran the the hoist up and down. I just didn't want the confinement. I was scared. Uh, scared, just. You know, being underground and not not being able to open the door and leave. So I never went underground. I should have, but I never did. And what is the age that you worked then at the... I mean, to me, right, right out of high school, when I graduated in the 60s, about 24, 25, 26. Okay. Worked at Safeway, like I said, carrying groceries, but that wasn't no money. And did you make, was there anybody your age working at the mill at that at, time, or were people older? Oh, no, they had uh, a lot of kids my age worked there. Then their dads worked there, Pete Crawford and J.E. Garber, Jim McLean. Uh, the college kids would come up and work at the mine in the bull gang, just fixing things. Then us kids that didn't go to college, we had our permanent jobs up there. Okay. But I knew all the men that worked there because they were fathers here. Mm -hmm. And do you have anybody that you remember that was like a character or anything that you'd like to talk about? Oh, my God. Well, Casus down here, but uh, at the mine, oh, my God, I knew, knew uh, Claire uh, Wells. Wells uh, showed me how to do all the ball mills. Like I said, uh, steel balls were the size of a softball, and I had to put 150 balls in each ball mill. That's what they were called. 150 in each one. That got tiring. But that crushed the ore up as the ball mill went around. And did you work like eight-hour shifts? How were your shifts? Eight hours. Eight-hour shift. Eight hours, yeah. And was there night shifts for that Oh, it, it ran 24 hours, yes. And uh, what type of ore were you or were you extracting? Uh, it was mostly zinc and lead. And I think the train would eventually, after the miners, my dad took ore from up there and dumped it in the ore cars. I think it went to Texas someplace and was smelted down. But they got gold, copper. They got a lot of expensive ore from that mine. That's what kept it going for so long. But uh, I really don't know all the history of what the ore was. It's probably in the books, but I lead, zinc, copper, gold. A lot of gold is there. 
And then uh, one of the things that I'm discovering is that there was a lot of Mexican miners that worked under. Yes, there was. Yes, there was. And then how, like, how many do you think was it a large percentage of them? I would say three quarters of them were Hispanics because they followed the mines. And when it closed down, jumping ahead here, when they closed down, 90% of them went to Baghdad. And that mine is still open, but a lot of the retired guys now are Hispanics, and that's where most of them went to Baghdad after the Iron King closed down. Iron King was mostly Hispanics. You're right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you work with any of them in the mill? Uh, yes, yes, I did. Yes, mm -hmm. I did. Do you remember any of their names? Uh, Alex Muncha was one. And I see him up at Billy Jack's there every once in a while. Oh, my God. Casus, uh, Casus worked there. Oh, my God. You caught me off guard. Yeah. I knew, I, I knew quite a, a Gina Lawners from Prescott. I knew, I knew 20, 30 of them, but the Volios, my ex-wife's dad and all of his boys worked there. Oh my God. Caught me off guard on names. And then one of the other things that I was starting to learn is that in Dewey Humboldt there was like a Mexican town. That there was an area where a lot of... Yes, that was right down here to the left and kind of the Hispanic way to town you, you could say. But we didn't think anything of it. It was just, they were people too, you know. Played with them. Grew up with them. And matter of fact, I still have a few beers at Whiskey Roll with them. And, uh, but to really get back to reminiscing and calling my old friends, we're getting older. And they're married now. They got their families and kids. So it's hard to meet and talk to them anymore. And it just, just don't go out of our ways calling each other. And do are, are a lot of the people still around then? The, uh, the kids are. A lot of kids are still here, but parents are gone just like ours. Mm -hmm. Uncles are all gone, so it's just quite a few years since all that happened. And then... Um, did you then, after working in the mill, what did you then do for uh, work? For what work? For work, I guess. You worked in the mill, and then after the mine closed down, then you left there? Uh, went to the valley, went to uh, college down. Oh, I got drafted. I got drafted in 60, 66. Trained one year at Fort Riley, Kansas, um, Vietnam one year. So thank God I made it out of there. But So I get that money there, and then, you know, I didn't spend all my money buying new cars and everything, but, you know, I started saving, started saving money. Worked Ma Bell, <coughs> worked for Ma Bell Telephone Company. That was, that lasted a uh, telephone lineman. That was Wickenburg, Humboldt, Chino Valley, Winslow, Holbrook. I worked in all them little towns. That was a good job. Uh-huh. And then, um, I don't know, the, it seems like, it's, I always find it really interesting that your family has deep roots in the area, right? That you basically... Yeah, 1900 your... till now, and we still live here. But everything is paid for now, so why would I want to move any? But I had to go to the valley 20, 30 years, and I'm selling my home down there because this is my home up here, and the people I know, the kids and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, thinking back on your work and your experience at the Iron King Mine, what information do you want future generations to know about it? Well, a lot of materials come from underground. 
So that's what makes cars and everything else, brickwork, cement, you know, cement, water, sand, rocks, makes concrete. So the mines played its part, part when we grow up and they're still mining, still mining all over the world right now. So the mine did play a, the big, it was really important to give people work. Thank God, if the mine had never opened up here or uh, Skull Valley and uh, Chino Valley and all them, they probably wouldn't be there either in Humboldt, especially in Dewey. They wouldn't be here until the businesses start coming in. You know, we got Ford dealership now, we got Chevy, Costco, oh God, just name the businesses that are here now. But they took over what the mine, which closed down, used to take, which used to pay for. What would you like the memory of your work and your experience at the Iron King Mine, how would you like that to be remembered? Well, first of all, we made a living, you know, in good money. It was close to home and you knew everybody. Their memories is, uh, now we're the older people. It's just good memories and we still live here. Thank God my parents left us all this and it's paid for now. So we don't have too many problems, just worry about our health. And I walk down to the Mama's Cafe, which is a Hispanic restaurant, every day, a mile each, half a mile each way. So I take an hour walk and walk down there, but you just try to stay healthy and live, live a good life. And then is there, um, has, I guess, has working at the Iron King Mine changed your perspective in... For example, the environment, or just like how you're pre, how you're saying that uh, metals are used in a lot of different yeah. things. Well, that held the town together. We knew everybody. Now the work is at Prescott Valley, Prescott. I had to go to Phoenix and went to college there, the junior college for a while. Then I worked down there at different jobs and bought me a home. Now I got that to sell. But I was down there 30, 40 years. Then I moved back up here when mom and then my brother moved down from Kingman. And then Sonia come from California. She lives downstairs with her husband. And it's just good to have everything and every brother and sister here, Sonia's husband. It's just good to have everything here and reminisce about the old town, the buildings. Some buildings are still standing. But it's just, it's a, our comfort zone. I think that's the way to say it. And John Young and the Historic Society, it's just beautiful to know a lot of people. But then again, you got hundreds of people moving across the river that I don't know. It's like another town, which it is, but it's just good to be back home. And then what I... What memories do you have with your brothers and sisters then? Oh, here? riding our bikes, riding the burrows, playing baseball here, down at the field there, going to school with all the classmates. Just uh just good memories here. Mm -hmm. But most of the most people are gone though. Yeah, my age. They had to move out to get work, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's just good to be here. And was your mother a stay-at-home mother? No, she was a meat wrapper for Safeway for 23 years and uh, drove back and forth. But, you know, this, this was our home. And is there, so these are pretty much all the questions that I have. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you want to say that I might oh, have man. left out? Because I know I'm just trying to this, think of your... Number uh, one... Number one is health. Then George worked highway department. I worked down there and made it. Going to sell my home down there. And I got friends down there for 30, 40 years. But my main objective is just coming back up here, seeing the people who are the kids now, like me, kids, yeah, who are still around and just enjoying where we grew up.
Yeah, and it was, is it, then has it changed a lot? Oh my God, across the river, I don't know any anybody there. But it's just good being back home, family belonging to the, the Historic Society, knowing all them people. It's just good to be home. You feel comfortable. You feel comfortable. Where are you from? I am from Nogales originally. Okay, now when you get there, do you feel comfortable and you reminisce, but it's changing too. It's changing. Yeah. But this is my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Got my brother and sister here. Wow. Yeah. 